On today's Visual Studio Toolbox, we're going to look at a tool called Web Map that you can use to take a desktop app and easily and quickly turn it into a web app. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today are Dee Dee Walsh and John Brown. Hey, guys. Hey. I'm, I'm Dee Dee. He's John. I'm John. <laughs> From Mobilize.net. <laughs> Hey. And we are going to talk about what do you do with your legacy line of business apps. Now, let's understand that legacy means that it works perfectly fine and it's running the business. Right. But you have these apps that have been built quite some time ago that you're maintaining, and you have all this new stuff going on, containers and web and cloud, and you might want to modernize your applications in some form. and. That's basically what you guys do. Yep, that's what we do because we're the old Visual Basic Visual Studio <laughs> right. team from Didi way back. And I go way, way back. <laughs> and John's uh -huh. an old Microsofty, so we were at Microsoft for between our everyone in our company. We have about a hundred years of Microsoft. <laughs> <Something like that. laughs> so we're the team that got you into it. Yes. So now we'll we'll help you get back out again. So. Uh -huh. So with that, uh, John will uh, take Absolutely. over and talk through some of this. Yeah. So I got a little PowerPoint and I got a little demo. And okay. I call the PowerPoint Saving the Beaver. And it's not uh, <laughs> that beaver. It's not Beaver Cleaver. And it's also the idea of reversing entropy in legacy code. Because, you know, entropy always moves forward in a closed mm -hmm. system, right? OK. So um, what is this? This is a de Havilland Beaver. OK. And that's Kenmore Air. You've probably flown on them. I have. Yep. You know, they fly right, out of, right yep. across the water here. OK. And the de Havilland Beaver was, they haven't been built since 1967. They built these aircraft from 1947 to 1967. They built over a thousand of them. It's one of the 10 best products ever out of Canada, including hockey pucks and ice, apparently. <laughs> okay, and not to mention, you know, snow, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the best product. Um, and the reason that they're still in operation was they do exactly what they were designed for, okay, which is short takeoff and landing operations. They're the world's greatest bush plane, mm -hmm. okay? But they've been modernized, okay? And Kenmore Air basically has this ongoing process of getting these planes from, you know, militaries all over the world, modernizing them and flying them daily, okay? Because they do exactly the right thing. Now, there was another aircraft I want to mention, which was the famous ME-163, the world's worst fighter jet, okay? This was a, a last-ditch uh, attempt by Hitler to shoot down bombers flying over Germany in World War II. Mm -hmm. So he took a rocket engine and stuck it in this thing. They took some poor sucker and put him in the cockpit. The thing took off. It could only fly for three minutes before the engine ran out of gas. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and then they had to glide back and try to land the thing. Okay, uh -huh. and the fuel was so combustible. If you spilled any on your leather flying jacket, you'd burst into flames. Okay, so you know the question is: Is your legacy <laughs> code a De Havilland Beaver or the world's worst fighter aircraft? Okay, and so okay. obviously there's there's code out there, and we see it in our company every day that's running applications, that's running businesses, it has, you know, it's been worked on for years, like the Beaver, it's, it, but it needs to be modernized, right. okay? And so, so, you know, I was watching uh, VS Toolbox, and you had this great two-part thing about containers, yep. right? And so the question is, well, what about all that stuff? If your application, if your legacy application is a web app today and you're hosting it on your local data center, whatever, yeah, great, move it to Azure, you know, refactor it, build microservices, all that stuff. It doesn't work for a desktop app. You, right. you can't really take a desktop app and, and, and host it in the cloud and have lots of people work on it, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a terrible solution. So what we've got is a way with technology to move desktop apps from the desktop, okay, all the way to a, a really well-formed web application. Okay. okay. And so that's really what I thought I'd demo. Cool. All right. So um, let's get out of my favorite software, PowerPoint. Everybody's favorite. <laughs> Everybody's favorite <laughs> software. Thank you, Microsoft Office. This is something, brace yourself. Oh, this my is gosh. This is VB6. There it is. Right? There VB6, it is. VB6, there it is. And, you know, it's, it was well-beloved in its time, uh, mm -hmm. reviled by I've, all of us on I the I built a world. few of those apps. Y yeah, yeah, we did this, right? Okay, and if we run this guy, this is a, a little canonical uh, ERP system that we created as a demo, as a demo test bed. And basically what it does is it's a fictitious so, uh, seafood wholesaler called Salmon King Seafood. And here I can create an order. I can do a search on my database and look up customers, you know, based on a text field like a W. Um, I can put in uh, orders. We all look at this and we, and we laugh and we shudder. Oh, that's so ancient. But yeah. there are 
lot, tons millions and tons of, of these. Oh, yeah. millions of these apps actually still in use, oh, running yeah. the business. And Mil do we million. get credit for not using Northwind traders? <laughs> right. <laughs> so the you know the the things that, that are interesting about this from a Going from desktop to web, there's a couple things that are going on here. One is we've got a lot of data bound controls, right? There's mm -hmm. actually an access database behind this. Okay. Right? Um, and we've got this modal dialog right here, which is so common in Windows desktop apps. You never see them in web apps because they're a nightmare, right? right? Because right now I suspended this execution thread on my laptop. Can't do that on a web server when you've got all these simultaneous sessions going on, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to be able to map these things forward also. The look and feel, you know, the way that like if I hit tab, the focus moves, you know, so these are line of business apps. These are ones that are just hammering on every day by customers and right. by users. And you can't just take this and completely change it. You have to try and preserve the user experience so you don't have to retrain people from, from scratch. The training so costs are some of the highest costs yeah. associated right. with this okay. kind of stuff. Yep. So let's ditch out of, uh, oh, see it's modal, I gotta get out of here. Um, <laughs> let's ditch out of VB6 and hope we never have to look at that again. And now, um, let me, um, uh, so what we're going to do is, I have to see which version I'm in here. I want to go to uh, Visual Studio 2015. We have okay. a tool, Robert, Microsoft <coughs> actually paid for it to get built 15 years ago, okay? And it's called... 20 Vis years ago. 20 years ago, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's true, yeah. It's been around for what now, 17 years, yeah, yeah. right? Uh -huh. So uh, Tom Button, our, our you know, beloved and fearless leader, you know, indeed, he found this company in Costa Rica, and they, while they were still on the Microsoft side, and they paid them to build this tool. It used to be part of Visual Studio, Visual Basic Upgrade Companion. So that yep. lets you take vis that Visual Basic six and move it to .NET. Okay, and so that's what I've done here with that very same application. It's boring to watch the process, okay? But you know, you find all of your OCXs, you make sure they all work, you resolve all <coughs> of those issues, and then, you know, there's always gonna be things you have to fix, okay, once you move it to C-sharp or mm -hmm. VB.net, right? You've got array, you know, indexes, you've got stuff like is, uh, you know, is empty that doesn't pass forward and things like that, right? But what we try to do with this one is, again, preserve the look and feel, right? not have to have the uh, developer um, try and understand everything new from so scratch. you took the VB6 app uh, and you converted it to a C-sharp WinForms app. Yep. Okay. Uh -huh. So every VB form now has a <coughs> C-sharp file mm -hmm. and a designer file. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can use the WYSIWYG, you know, uh, Visual Studio Designer to update those controls and set properties on them. Okay. Right. The business logic is all intact. We've preserved all the symbol names, all the object names, you know, all of the module names. We've preserved all the original comments. And now where there's places where there's some discrepancy between what VB6 could do syntactically or semantically and what C Sharp or .NET can do, we've generated an error message basically as a comment with a URL. Okay. okay, click here for more information. And then we've done some things, you know, they're trivial, but they're sometimes important. Like instead of on error go to, <coughs> go to try catch. Okay. okay, things like that. All right, but this is still on the desktop. It yep. still works the same and, way. And it could be okay. VB.net if, if customers want to stay with right. sure. VB. Right. So this is fine for some customers. They're still captive to the desktop, right? But when you think about the number of people that want to use a non-Windows device, mm -hmm. okay, or they want to be able to access it from a variety of devices in a variety of different situations, or they want to reduce the deployment costs of dealing with actual executables that have to be installed. Okay, right. of course, Windows 10 will fix that at some point, right? <laughs> but right now, <laughs> you know, it can be a problem. Um, so you can build it as a web app, okay? And that does a lot of great things because then it's ready to go up to the cloud. Right. It's ready to implement things like CI, CD, DevOps, all the cool, the coolness that you can get with those things, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's gotta be a well-formed web app. Right? Right. So now we run into <coughs> these problems of, well, you go from a single user to multi-user, single session to multi-session, you've got network latency, you've got a, um, a very, very restricted sandbox for the UI inside the browser, right? That you have to work with. And you still wanna be able to have code that the developer can understand. This may be come to surprise you. Some of our customers, developers, are not the world's most cutting edge guys <laughs> if they're still working on VB6 apps. <laughs> so when they see, you know, web apps with Angular and JSON and Ajax and you know it's a lot uh, UI frameworks and JavaScript and TypeScript and you know, their heads explode, right? Right. So we wanted to try and solve some of that complexity for them. Okay. And I think that's what we've got. So what we have is a tool called WebMap. Okay. okay. 
And what WebMap does is it can read in WinForms C -sharp .net source code. It uses AI to sort of churn it. Okay, and what it's looking for is it's looking for patterns that it understands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a good example of that is let's say that you've got um, some SQL code, where you're doing some sort of a, a CRUD operation on SQL inside your code. There's basically two or three parts of that that are really standard, right? Where you're going to make a connection, you're going to do some sort of an operation, and you're going you're to have a result from that operation that's returned, right? But those three things may be separated by a lot of code. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things that the AI engine can do is go in and identify that pattern of, oh, A, B, C, boom, I know what to do with this on the back end, okay? So if we were to migrate this to WebMap, what would the code look like? What does that mean, migrate this to WebMap? Okay, so WebMap is the tool, just mm -hmm. like VBUC is the tool that, that, you know, it's a one and done migration from VB6 to Is it an extension .net. inside Visual Studio? Is it a standalone tool? A, right it now it's like? a standalone tool. Okay. Running okay. in Azure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Runs in Azure. Okay. Um, the the only version I have right now just has a command line interface, which is hip again. So that's cool. But okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's kind of boring to watch, you know. But it basically it takes a code base. I point it to like this is where all the code is. I okay. say here's the input, here's the output, creates a new directory, and so that would look like this. Let's look at a briefly canonical example, um, real quick. So if we were to look at something that is a little easier to get our heads around than that application, um, here is a uh, little hello world application, okay? And um, when we look at the op we look at the source code that's created, you notice there's a migrated solution basically, mm -hmm. right? And there's a solution file uh, one level up. So if we go into this, what we'll see is a C# -sharp file right? Okay. A solution, we'll see a Angular directory, and in the Angular directory, we're going to see all of the things that we normally see. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to our uh, bigger example here, and let's start with the back-end code. Okay. So once again, we have um, a, f uh, basically for every original form, okay, we have a C-sharp file, right? And if you look at the code, it doesn't look that different than uh, WinForms code, mm -hmm. okay? Even though this is actually running in ASP.NET Core, running a web server on the back end. And the nice thing about this is, is that because we've preserved all of this sort of familiar code pattern, the developer from, let's say, from the WinForms version mm -hmm. can maintain this, they can read it, they'll understand it, okay? They can, you know, they can fix bugs in it, right? Now, um, if we look inside the directory, we see this www root directory, okay? And that was generated by the front end. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see what that looks like. Right now, I'm going to bring that up in uh, Visual Studio Code because it's just a little friendlier to the sort of the world of Angular and, and web development, right? And once again, we can <coughs> see over in our um, app directory, we have all of our components for all of our forms, okay? So each form gets its own folder. And inside of there will be three files, TypeScript file that basically sets all the imports, defines the components, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be an HTML file and a CSS file. So if we look at one of those, uh, and I think that's the same guy here. So here's our TypeScript file. And um, you can see that basically we're importing some web map type stuff. Okay, there's some mobilized namespaces here. And this is where the magic happens, because we've got these packages that are going to map a lot of the Angular stuff and the Kindo framework that we're using right now to build all the controls for mm -hmm. the UI. They're going to map those over to HTML and CSS. Okay, so if we look at, for example, the HTML file, even though we're using Angular 5 and we're using Kindo for Angular, right, you're not going to see any references in here to those native controls, okay? So we've extracted all of that to our class definitions, which map right back to those same namespaces in, in the source code, okay. okay? The whole point of this is to make it simple, okay? Now, a lot of people would do this approach, but they'd have a binary runtime that would basically sit between the, um, the, the, the operating system or the browser and the source code, okay? And, and there's nothing wrong with that approach, except that it creates a dependency on the company that released the runtime to maintain it and extend it, 
Okay, and we've seen some examples in the past where those companies abandoned that or they went out of business or something bad happened, leaving the users who had already embraced that technology in sort of a lurch. Okay, so we're doing everything with basically source code, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the next question is, of course, is how are we able to have this sort of wind forms looking code here, okay, and make it actually into a web application, right? right? And so as you and I were talking a few minutes ago, we're using the, the .NET compiler framework, is that what it's called now? Uh, .NET compiler platform, a.k.a. Roslyn, Roslyn, Roslyn right. right, which is Visual Studio 2017, right? Yep. And so Roslyn supports this concept of weaving, which is aspect-oriented programming, right? So you take these common concerns, you know, a real normal example of this is logging, where you, every, every method you want to be able to log something, right? But you don't want to clutter up the code of every method with these calls to some sort of a logging class, right? Mm -hmm. So aspect-oriented programming lets you take those sorts of what's called cross-cutting concerns and put them somewhere else. And then the compiler figures out, you basically, you set an attribute, say, hey, this thing is, you know, this is a concern. So deal with this, you know, when you go to compile, right? Then the compiler can take that and take that attribute and inject code, okay, after, the, you know, the you and I of the world have, you know, partied on it, right? Okay. Before it actually generates IL, okay? And so if you actually look in our source tree, what you're gonna see is inside the OBJ folder, all of these C-sharp files that are super complicated to read because Roslyn has injected all of this code. So it's injected code, for example, to listen to every object in the UI and understand if its state has been changed. Okay, has that object been dirtied, right? It's got code injected in there that will um, take care of modal dialogue. So when that, you know, do you want to save or, or cancel dialog box comes up, right? We can still do that, and I'll show it in just a second when I run the app. What we're doing is we're suspending all the state that led up to that point, okay, very carefully, and managing that so that when the user comes back and completes mm -hmm. that action, it just runs seamlessly without interfering with anything else going on, okay? So that's how this works. So let's take a look at what happens if we hit go here. And we've got a little console that comes up right now that's just an internal tool for tracking. So it's going to check all the packages. <coughs> it's going to build it. And what's cool, also, we can do this for like Power Builder, and if you want to move power off of Power Builder, wow. we help. <laughs> yeah, you. you remember Power Builder? <laughs> I do. And you know what? There's a lot of customers yeah, out sure. there that that use that. So this is a web app. Yeah. That purposefully has the same UI um, as the WinForms app, which yeah. basically has the same UI as the, yeah. as the, the VB6 app. app. Yeah. So the Again, idea. these are these are line of business right. apps yeah. where customer, you know, the users have been <coughs> using these right. for years. So your training cost yeah. of how to use the app is minimal. And it should it's work the same, the same way. If I type a W it in, the same. Okay, yeah. Yeah. it's going to okay. do a data lookup, right? If I click on uh, this fictitious company, WAPEC, it's going to populate this grid control down here. You know, selecting the quantity is going to highlight it down here. Mm -hmm. Changing the quantity does a lookup and a calculation. If I say save it, ooh, there's a modal dialog. Okay. Okay. And it is a modal dialog. I can't do anything now right. until I do something with this dialog. Wow. Right. And the other thing that's cool about this is um, it's MDI. So I can come up here now and go like, oh, look, I got multiple documents on the, on the, uh, in the frame. Crazy. Okay. And, you know, all of the usual sort of Windows type data bound control stuff is working. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we've done a lot of cool stuff behind the scenes that's completely invisible here to make sure this thing will run fast. Okay, right. because now you take something that was designed for you know a single user and you're going to make how and only you know unknown number of users run it right. So one of the things we do that our guys came up with that I thought was super clever is this second grid control right here. Okay, right now there's nothing in there, mm -hmm. so we haven't actually <coughs> instantiated the grid control in the UI. Okay, we actually, it's just invisible, so we don't even load it. As soon as something happens where I select and we're going to load down here, then we build it. Okay. So we make the app list chatty. Okay. The second thing is, is all these data bound controls, instead of using the classic AJAX JSON sort of pattern where we update the server side model, because this is MVVM obviously, right? Uh, we're using Web API. Mm -hmm. So we go right past all of that, go get the data from the struct where it's been loaded, okay, bring it right back, okay, and save a lot of grief on both sides, okay. And since it's Web API, 
that endpoint could be, you know, right now it's just a RESTful endpoint in our code, but it could be a web server. It could so be where is a web service. Where is the data? What did you do with that? Where is the data? It's, it's well, not still you know, sitting in access, it's right? It's out there in the clouds. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, this application, again, we haven't, I didn't bother to like change it to SQL Server. I've actually got the database move to SQL Server on the computer. Okay. But, you know, it's just a question of changing the connection stream. Got it. Okay. okay. So now you could take the database, and I could put that in Azure. I could leave the uh, web server on prem. You know, in right. my data center. You could leave the SQL server on prem. You could too, leave the SQL right? server you on. You prem. don't. This doesn't you, have to be cloud. It could exactly. be an internal right. web app. The whole thing talking be, to internal data. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you wanted, and we had a customer that wanted to do this, it could all be just running in localhost. Okay. Sure. Because why not? Right. Hmm. You know. Like now you're not limited to what kind of device. I know right. I'm at Microsoft. I don't want to say that, but <laughs> I see a lot of MacBooks out there, and you have them here on this desk uh -huh. from time to time. I've seen that, right? So you know you could just run the whole thing on localhost, right? Or you can run it, you know, on-prem. You can run it hybrid. You can run it all on the cloud. But you've got all these okay. options. So let's say I, I do this. Let's say I, I start from a WinForm app. Let's let's skip the VB6 to .NET yeah. part. Yeah, um, yeah. please. That's been talked about. <laughs> I've got a, an existing WinForm app written in C Sharp. Mm -hmm. I run it through the tool. It's now a web app yes. with a bunch of code that looks familiar to me. Yeah. And then a bunch of Angular and TypeScript mm -hmm. and CSS that I haven't necessarily had the chance to learn yet. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to be building, building web apps, it's probably now a good time to start learning that. But that's a journey that I'm just starting now. Yeah. Right. How do I maintain? I can maintain this app. What if I need to make a change? Do I have to go back to the WinForm app and then run the mapping tool again? Great question. Great question. It's so not I guess it's a two-part question. How do I make changes in both places? Because we're still potentially going to maintain this existing desktop app. We may be getting rid of it. We may be keeping it and extending it with the web version. Um, or if we are literally getting rid of the desktop app and now I'm expected to continue to working learn on this, this app that's right. now written in a bunch of stuff that I don't know yet. All right. Well, those are both great questions. Let's take the second one first. The scenario you just described where you maintain two parallel sets of source code, mm -hmm. that is a rarity. We do have a very, very large customer in Brazil that needed to do that with Power Builder. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went to actually using this technology to Java Spring MVC on the, on the back end side. But normally, because this is normally not a transpiler. It's a one and done scenario, okay. right? Because there's a lot of fix ups and changes you have to make. You know, from the desktop, if I were accessing my C drive, I can't do that in a web app very easily, right? right? Because that, that's not accessible. So I have to go in and change that code. If I were accessing hardware, I'd have to change that code. So to have that sort of all keep redoing that, that would be kind of complicated. Okay. Okay. Now the first question is, well, how do you extend this? Do you have to know Angular and Ajax and JSON and TypeScript and oh God? No, because what we've done is we've made it so that using your WinForm skill set, in effect, you can go in and say like, okay, I'm going to um, add a control. Let's say it's a, it's a drop down, okay, mm -hmm. and it's going to be data bound, so it's going to go do a lookup based on some business rules on, on a, say on an event somewhere else, right? And now I want to be able to have like a control button, a command button that does something. You can drag. Well, you can't drag and drop yet because you know we're still using the designer files that are that are XML, but. We will have support for the drag and drop WYSIWYG designer. Mm -hmm. but you can go in and basically party on the designer file, okay, using your familiar code, right, and just add those controls. You then go in and basically, and using C Sharp, just handle the events like you're used to handling them. And then over on the client side, you take the name of the control as you've done, you just add the HTML, you add the class and the CSS, okay. And you're pretty much done. Okay? okay. And we'll have a we'll have a blog and a video on that in a couple of weeks. Okay. So people want to come back to our website, mobilize.net. Okay. Want to see how that's done? I'm going to build one of those. Okay. As well. And then if you do get to the point where you know Angular and TypeScript and all that fairly well, you would you can go straight to those you can files. Go to those yeah. Files. Yeah. Yeah. Changes, yeah. So right? so let's say that you hire a web developer. They're not going to know this. They're going to go like, wait, this doesn't look like what I'm familiar with, right? right? Some of it does. I see your packages and your components and all that. But you know, I want to do it my way. You can do that. Mm -hmm. The way we've designed our RESTful endpoints is we're building a GUID that attaches to them. So you're going to want to work a little around that. Okay. So maybe you build a new endpoint on the server. Maybe it's a microserver. Maybe it's a serverless function you know, an Azure function. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just go in and you write whatever UI code you want, 
okay, and handle it using a normal thing. You may have people that say like, well, you're using Kindle, I want to use a different control set. Sure, just take those libraries and bring them in and then use those components as well, right? Should work just perfectly. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. It's good stuff. Yeah. Get, and it moves customers fast, so. Yes, yeah, so yeah. you don't have to wait until you've learned all the web technology yeah. before you can build can the app. You yeah. can, you can yeah. do this. You've got a huge amount of plumbing code behind the scenes yeah. doing the mapping, yeah. which coincidentally is also the name of the product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Weird, that. huh? <laughs> wow. Weird, cool. huh? So thanks for that. <laughs> yes. You know, and like that, de Havilland, you save all the good stuff, right? <coughs> right? Because we don't break the business logic. We just move it forward and, yep. and re repurpose it, right? So that stuff that's been sorted out over all those years, you know, um, you know, we don't break that. We mm -hmm. just keep it forward. So it's a fast way for people to get forward. So people can, can go to the site. Uh, there's a trial version of this. They can actually take an app and give it a shot and see what happens. And yeah, yep. if, yeah, yep. absolutely. And, we, and then uh, it's, a, it's a nice path forward if, if that's yeah. something you need to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, as opposed to, so, so we've heard you talk a lot about like the containers mm -hmm. and, <coughs> and like virtualization and which are all great options. Um, but this sort of is the option for when you really do have a valuable app that you want to get, you know, you really don't want the old stuff. Right. So like the scenario where you want to keep the desktop, there are a lot of customers who really do want to adopt Azure fully and want to adopt, you know, the latest right. technologies and, and really ditch the old yeah. stuff. So this is the scenario where you can get rid of all okay. of your old stuff. Because uh, we just did a show um, with uh, Nishanil and we took um, a WPF app and then uh, originally this started out, you have your WPF app, you can cloud enable it. So right. we'll put the WCF service in the cloud, the data in the cloud, but keep the front end. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what he did was he took that front end and made a Xamarin app out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but the idea there is you're not necessarily never again going to use the desktop app. Right. You just like to be able to work with expenses on your phone in addition to doing the primary work yeah, yeah. in the desktop app. Right. So that's kind of a companion app. Here you're basically saying, we don't want to have to maintain this WinForm app anymore. Yeah. We want to move to web, but we don't want to have to start from scratch and write the whole thing from and scratch. And all that valuable business logic, which right. the customers we deal with, and you know, a lot of Microsoft customers who mm -hmm. have old stuff <coughs> that they've been working on for years, and they've tuned it, and they're just kind of stuck. Right. And so we can very quickly get them unstuck and onto the cloud yep. and onto Azure. And, and actually, a lot, we have, you know, we can get them, help them use GitHub and <laughs> get open source. Like a lot of customers are now unblocked from yep. using open source and all and that. Kind this of. is a web app, so we can run internally, it can run yeah. in a container, it can yeah. run in Azure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. So cool. Good stuff. That's great stuff. Anyway. Thanks for coming on and showing us that. Yeah, we're Thank always you. glad to see you, Robert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Robert. A day without Robert Green is a day without sunshine. Oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. That's a, a really nice thing to look into if you're in this situation. Thanks for coming on the show, and we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox. Thanks, man.